Um, on behalf of the Pediatrics Residency Program and the Grand Rounds Committee, thank you everyone for being here today, both in person and online. Um, I'm not Dr. Leonard, clearly. My name is Aiden. I'm one of the Pediatric Chief Residents. Dr. Leonard was, uh, is unable to make it today, so I'll be doing the intro or the welcome remarks and the intro, so you'll see a lot of me today. Um, a few housekeeping items before we begin. Um, heads up for our next few lectures. Our next one is by Dr. Chris Russell on respiratory infections in children with medical complexity, which will be an insightful lecture. And um, before we get started, we always like to start with our um, Stanford University land acknowledgement, uh, where we acknowledge that Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Mwekma Ohlone tribe. Um, and this land continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people and consistent with our values of community and inclusion. We always like to acknowledge and honor and make visible the university's relationship to um, native people. Um, this year, um, you're all here for our annual Redeem Marie de Carlo lecture. And um, uh, Serena and Ingrid have put together a set of slides and audio from Marianne Cormac, Carmack and uh, Joan Fisher to help us remember Rudine. So we'll um, take about five minutes to watch the video together and then we'll introduce Dr. Pan and um, start our lecture. We really think it's remarkable that after nearly 30 years from her death, those who knew Rudine continue to be inspired by her life and carry her lessons about patient care with them into our work. Some here were fortunate enough to know Rudine, but for those who did not, who was Rudine and why did she inspire such devotion to keeping her memory alive? To answer this, we should give you a bit of history. Rudine was diagnosed with chronic myelogenous leukemia when she donated blood just a few weeks before she graduated from Tulane Medical School. This was a time before the lovely tyrosine kinase inhibitors were on the market. And really, this was a death sentence for Rudine. Um, nevertheless, she started her internship and residency here at Stanford full of vim, vigor, and cheer, choosing not to burden her coworkers with her diagnosis. She wanted to achieve what she did on her own abilities with no special treatment. Initially, she told very few people of her illness. In fact, when she had her first bone marrow transplant during residency, very few people even knew that it happened. Now, what they did know was that an amazingly bright and capable physician, as well as a total team player, was Rudine. Remarkably, she returned two clinical rotations after her bone marrow transplant. When it was apparent that the transplant had failed to cure her, she then courageously underwent a second transplant. Um, she was so determined to complete her training, she did so shortly before she comes come to her disease. Her colleagues and friends and family started this lectureship and meet each year to remember Rudine and to perpetuate the lessons that she taught us about compassion for others during her own illness. We all have different stories about Rudine's impact on us. She was the consummate host in a sense. She was fun to be with and always made everyone around her feel comfortable and cared for. She would not expect others to feel sorry for her, often reciting her favorite quote from the Forrest Gump movie, life is like a box of chocolates because you never know what you're going to get. We thought the best way to give a sense of why Rudine continues to inspire us and those who knew her would just to be sharing a couple of vignettes about uh, the sense of who Rudine was. So this is a story that illustrates Rudine's selfless compassion and was told to me recently by her attending when Rudine was an intern on the pulmonary service. In that era, patients with cystic fibrosis uh, were admitted to children's hospital long after they were adults, sometimes well into their 20s or 30s or even even older. And this was not exactly the stuff of pediatrics. And many residents felt that, well, this wasn't really contributing to their training to become pediatricians. So one day the team learned that an adult patient that they knew well was being admitted. This person was much older than any of them and was famously irascible and uh, difficult. So no one wanted the assignment of taking the, doing the history and physical. 
So Rudine cheerfully volunteered. And when she presented her findings to her attending, her initial remarks were to the effect of, what a nice man and such an interesting case. And in the words of her attending, Rudine saw this as an opportunity to provide compassionate care to a very ill and fragile fellow human being, not as an annoying imposition. And you know, as powerful as this vignette is as an illustration of Rudine's grace and compassion, to me, it's remarkable that 30 years after this event, her attending still remembers it. And to me, that's a just remarkable testament to Rudine's supreme gift to us as a role model that lasted forever. I will never forget uh, Rudine shortly before she died. She uh, was in the hospital at Stanford for quite a long time. And she had several impairments to live with. One day she asked me, why am I still here? How come I haven't died yet? It was just she and I. And I answered that perhaps her mission with us was not done. In response, she thought about the things that make a physician better from the perspective of a patient. She simply replied, very simple things really. Sit down when you talk to parents and patients. Wear a name tag and introduce yourself. Involve the patient in decision-making. Keep promises. Patients remember. Never underestimate the importance of touching your patients. And so we honor and remember Rudine for her gift to us, an enduring role model for compassion despite her own illness, while giving us a window into the world of being a patient. Um, thank you again for those wonderful slides and audio to help us remember Rudine. Um, I think every year when I listen to her life story at this annual lecture, I end up learning a lot more about the art of medicine and come away appreciating uh, the jobs that we have even more. Um, this year, our Rudine Marie DiCarlo um, lecturer is Dr. Richard Pan. Many of you might be familiar with his career as a state senator representing Sacramento and its uh, neighboring communities from 2010 to 2022. Um, he has been known to many as the voice of children's advocacy in our state's legislature. Um, among his myriad accomplishments, Dr. Pan has played a fundamental role in raising childhood vaccination rates in our state, um, helped secure health, dental, and vision coverage for 65,000 Sacramento children through um, co-founding the Healthy Kids and Healthy Futures Initiative. And also, he expanded the California newborn screen by adding severe combined immunodeficiency and an adrenal leukodystrophy to the panel. Um, he additionally has served as Sacramento County's first five commissioner, as a board member of United Way's um, California Capital Region, and currently serves on the California Healthcare Affordability Board. Here in his MD from the University of Pittsburgh, his MPH from Harvard University School of Public Health, and he completed um, pediatric residency and served as a chief resident at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, before serving on California's legislature, Dr. Pan served as a clinical associate professor um, of pediatrics at UC Davis, where he also served as a program director and played um, fundamental roles in developing curriculum surrounding the social determinants of health and uh, developing community-based uh, medical education. Dr. Pan has clearly led an inspirational career as an advocate, applying his unique insights as a pediatrician to improve the lives of countless Californian children. We are very lucky to have him here today for Grand Round, so please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Pan. All right, good morning. Well, it's uh, great to be here with all of you, and it's a tremendous honor to be giving the Redeen Marie DiCarlo Memorial Lectureship uh, here at Stanford. Uh, so, uh, and, and again, well, I appreciate uh, hearing her wonderful story here. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, uh, this is a little bit about how we got more kids health care coverage and also uh, a little bit about my career as well. Uh, so I'm calling it uh, medicine on a large scale. And that actually comes from a quote from uh, Rudolf Virchow, uh, so sort of sometimes known as the founder of modern pathology. And so this is actually the full quote. He said medicine is a social science and politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. Medicine as a social science, as a science of human beings, has the obligation to point out problems and to attempt their theoretical solution. And the politician, the practical anthropologist, must find the means for the actual solution. 
So I think that uh, some ways encapsulates a little bit of my uh, career as a, both a physician and as an elected official. Um, full disclosure, uh, I have I not have no financial relationships with any manufacturers. In fact, not going to be talking about any uh, commercial products. And uh, well, don't worry about. We're not going to talk about any approved or investigated use of commercial products. Um, the objectives are, first of all, to explain why child advocacy is essential to pediatrics, to identify policies that expanded healthcare coverage for children in California, and frankly, uh, many of them for the whole country, and to relate how pediatricians can practice medicine on a large scale, as Vercal said. So let's first start with pediatrics and child advocacy. And I know this is a, met, this is a residency program because I work uh, very closely with uh, Lisa Chamberlain and many other faculty here before in the past on child advocacy. I'm sure these are this may be familiar with you, to you, but just want to quickly review. First of all, of course, the definition of health from the World Health Organization. Uh, so health is not simply the absence of disease or infirmity, right? It's actually about the well-being, complete physical, mental, and social well-being of people. Uh, this chart comes from a, uh, uh, this diagram actually comes from a paper that talks about sort of what we call the professional obligations of uh, physicians, our responsibility in relation to influences on health. So you can see it's not just about individual patient care, uh, but it also involves access to care and, so, and direct socioeconomic influences. And uh, they even talk about uh, broader influences as well as areas of professional aspiration. So it's not just limited to the patients that you see in front of you. And of course, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a strong policy the, uh, uh, on the role of the pediatrician in engaging in communities to improve health. And so uh, actually this, uh, this policy, uh, while it uh, actually was recently renewed, so uh, even though it dates back to 2013, it's a strong statement from our own profession that it is important for pediatricians to engage in the community and to consider community health and the social determinants. And of course, the father of American pediatrics, Abraham Jacoby, uh, he said, it is not enough, however, to work at the individual beside a bedside in the hospital. In the near and dim future, the pediatrician is to sit in and control school boards, health departments, and legislatures. She is the legitimate advisor to the judge and jury. A seat for the physician in the councils of the Republic is what the people have the right to demand. So uh, the father of American pediatrics already said, we have a role beyond just taking care of patients and actually influencing and perhaps even serving as leaders in our community. And finally, I have to touch on uh, this uh, model uh, by uh, Richmond, is Julius Richmond. Uh, if uh, you're not familiar, he was actually a Surgeon General and Secretary of Health uh, under President Carter. He's the one who created the Healthy People campaign. So every 10 years, there's another Healthy People goal. And, uh, and uh, he came up with the model public policy and he said, there's three elements you need for public policy. One is scientific evidence, uh, the data, which is actually what we're all really good at in academic health centers, right? We generate lots of data, papers and so forth. The social infrastructure, social strategies for the solutions in place. Uh, but the third part is the part where we oftentimes uh, fall short, the political will. In fact, I like to say that when I ran for the legislature and was elected, I moved into my into the political will department, right? So it's about actually taking all the important data and things that people are doing and what can we try to move the political will to make the change? And in fact, we're gonna talk about the political will to get kids healthcare coverage today. So, so I'm gonna talk about a bit about my career in pediatrics on a large scale. And uh, this chart actually kind of demonstrates uh, sort of, uh, sort of the, the beginning and the end of the story. So interesting enough, uh, I actually finished my uh, fellowship in 1998, so that's here, and um, that's 2022. We don't think we have 2023 data yet. So uh, this is the percentage of children with health insurance coverage. So when I started, uh, after I finished my training, it was about 13%, uh, a little under 13.9%. We're down to 4.2. 4 so we certainly have made progress during at least certain my career in terms of reducing um, the number of children who ha don't have health insurance. So I like to say that my career was from the micro to the macro. Um, so I began, uh, I entered college uh, saying I want to be a doctor. I was a biophysics major at Johns Hopkins. 
uh, was thinking like I was going to discover the next great cure, right? Uh, molecular science, gene expression, all that fun stuff. Uh, actually, I got involved in this project and some grad student at UPenn actually beat us out for the paper. So my project kind of ended and I had to find a new thing to do. And there's this place called the Center for Hospital Finance and Management who had, hey, what do you want a student research assistant? And I said, hey, I'll sign up for that. And so that was a health policy center. And that's how I got my first experience in health policy. Um, went off to med school at the University of Pittsburgh, actually spent a couple of stints with the US Public Health Service. Uh, they have a program called the Coast Step Program. I don't know if anyone uh, even in that or heard of that. Interesting, I was first at York Health Corporation. York is a little city in the middle of Pennsylvania. They make Harley Davidsons, so hopefully you've heard of those uh, motorcycles. And then later I ended up in Philadelphia in 1991 uh, during a very large measles outbreak. So if anyone wonders how I got involved in vaccinations, no, it wasn't pharma paying me. It was actually seeing children die of measles. Uh, that was not supposed to happen in the United States. I uh, went off to did my residency at Mass General at that point uh, and actually uh, did my continuity clinic at Chelsea Health Center. And I think uh, anyone know Janice Lowe here? She is here. Uh, yeah, she was my preceptor in clinic. <laughs> so yes, she was my preceptor in continuity clinic over at Chelsea Health Center. Uh, and uh, and actually, when I became chief resident, established community health rotation. So at that point in time, I was totally bought in and said, okay, guess what? Uh, people need to do uh, community health and then did a fellowship at uh, Children's Hospital Boston and got my MPH to her, uh, where I did research on quality improvement, physician career choice, but also uh, on child advocacy and community pediatric education. And in fact, uh, that's um, when UC Davis came calling and said, by the way, we want someone to start a child advocacy program. But during residency, actually, and it, uh, I actually got sort of much more involved in uh, sort of policy making, actually through the Massachusetts Medical Society. So when I was during my residency fellowship, I was very involved in the residence section of the Massachusetts Medical Society. And a couple of things, events happened that really showed how important it was to me to be at the table. First was actually in 1995. Um, this is uh, the uh, New York Times. Uh, they came, there was a, uh, Basically, anyone heard of Newt Gingrich? All right, um, all right, okay, good. Uh, so he actually just became a Speaker of the House of Representatives. They had something called the Contract for America. They were going to reform all sorts of different things, including Medicare and Medicaid. In fact, they had come to an agreement with the uh, American Medical Association to do Medicare and Medicaid reforms. Uh, but by the way, each state medical society is independent of the AMA itself. Uh, so the president of the Massachusetts Medical Society decided to put a task force together to examine these proposals and say, what's the position our medical society going to be? Uh, there were six people on there. I was the resident member on there. I got appointed as a resident member. And so we looked at these proposals and many of them actually we liked, doctors liked, you know, some have involved like medical liability reform, some other things. But one part was in there that was the block granting of Medicaid. Now, my colleagues on the group, uh, actually, you know, they're very well-meaning, but none of, I was the only one because I was a pediatrician who took care of a lot of Medicaid patients. And so they were like, well, it's probably okay. And I said, no, this is a total disaster. Uh, because what happens is that that means every time we have a recession, there's going to be, you know, we're not going to have any enough, you know, number of people Medicaid go up. And they went, oh, that sounds terrible. So actually, we recommended to the Board of Trustees that we oppose this. And the Medical Society then officially took a position, opposition to there. And then um, that was reported by the Boston Globe. And this is an apocryphal story, but supposedly Ted Kennedy went down to the well of the Senate and said, uh, because they said, well, the doctors support this, and said, actually, my doctors don't. And that's when it died. Uh, so that's when the black, block grant team met. By the way, it keeps popping up all the time, but that's when it died that time. So I realized that how important it was, because if I wasn't sitting at the table at the time, uh, probably the rest of the group, not because they were nefarious at any, they you know, didn't like kids or anything like that, because they didn't understand um, that was not what population to take care of would not have happened. So uh, it's important to be involved. Uh, the other thing that happened actually uh, later on in 1996 was is that that time I was on the board of trustees for the medical society representing residents, uh, that there was a uh, legislator that actually chair of the uh, the House of Representatives in Massachusetts came to us and said, I have an idea, right? There's an opportunity for us to essentially, uh, in exchange of removing the employer mandate to actually uh, increase coverage for healthcare 
for kids if we uh, and fund it with a tobacco tax increase. Are you on board? And we said, yes, we're on board as a medical society. And we so put together a coalition uh, to basically uh, do this program. It's called the Massachusetts Act for Providing for Improved Access to Healthcare. Uh, we actually got it all the way to the governor's desk, Governor Weld, William Weld. I don't know if you heard of him. He actually ran for president on the, I think, libertarian ticket of, uh, of our, anyway, so he was running for the U.S. Senate against John Kerry, uh, and he vetoed it because it was a tax increase. We actually overrode his veto. That tells you how, you know, that's, that's really hard to do, someone who's been in the legislature. So we overrode his veto, so it went into place, and then Kerry gets elected to the Senate, he uh, says, wow, it's a very popular idea. After all, you know, we've got, got past the governor's veto. So he goes and starts talking about, okay, let's do this at the federal level. But John Kerry's not exactly a healthcare heavyweight. So he talks to the senior senator, Ted Kennedy. Ted Kennedy says, that's a great idea. Kerry bill became a Kennedy Kerry thing. But Kennedy said, I'm a smart guy. I know that this Republican Senate can't go anywhere. Talks to his friend, Orrin Hatch, the Republican senator for Utah. He says, oh, that sounds like a good idea. I have to do some tweaks to it. And then what happens is, is that uh, they actually put together uh, uh, a bill. So, uh, so this, this, this was important. And so that was S-CHIP, right? So S-CHIP was inspired by this bill that we did in Massachusetts. And again, it raised the federal tax on tobacco. In fact, it eventually uh, allocated $20 million, billion in matching funds for states over five years to expand coverage for children and families uh, below 200% of the federal poverty level. So before Medicare, um, I mean, Medicaid would cover uh, about up to 100 or, or 1.33. So again, it was Ted Kennedy and Erwin Hatch. Um, it, unfortunately, the actual original bill didn't make it, but they got it into the Balanced Budget Act, 1987, and was signed by President Clinton. And so that was, uh, so it was kind of exciting to see that again, being at the table, uh, working on this was able to actually, it's the largest expansion of healthcare coverage uh, for children, um, or actually for anyone uh, since Medicare, Medicaid. And uh, here in California, it got, in 1998, uh, we decided to implement it by creating a healthy families program. In fact, my last uh, assignment when I got my master's in public health was write a paper, say which of the three options that states could choose would be the best option uh, for, for, for Massachusetts. And it reduced the number of uninsured children from 10 million in 1997 to under 5 million in 2012. And SCHIP is still around today, and although Healthy Families isn't, we'll touch on that, and it was recently renewed in 2009, and it's actually called CHIPRA. So that was pretty exciting. We learned quite a bit in uh, residency and fellowship, uh, and then I ended up with, said, coming to California, as I mentioned, UC Davis said, hey, we want someone to start a child advocacy program. And that's how I ended up there. And I created a program called Communities of Physicians uh, Together to get doctors out in the community. But um, in addition to that, of course, uh, because I was telling residents, you need to go work out in the community, of course, I had to model that myself, right? You know, if you ever have a professor says, you should do this. Well, how do you do it? Oh, I don't do it myself, right? And that doesn't make sense. So you got to, you got to demonstrate, you also have to live what you teach, right? Uh, so I was... Uh, involved in not only, of course, the Medical Association, the Medical Society, I was actually became president of the County Medical Society and was uh, active in the American Academy of Pediatrics events, became vice chair, was also uh, on the County First Five Commission and actually still serve on our United Way board, so but got involved in that. And we all decided, we decided that um, one of the goals that we wanted to do was actually to get kids um, healthcare coverage, low-income kids, because there were still, despite the fact we had the Healthy Families Program and the Medi-Cal Program, uh, there were still kids who didn't, frank, actually, frankly, children who were undocumented, because if you were, did, you were not a documented immigrant, uh, you could not get uh, essentially publicly funded health care. So we created an organization called Healthy Kids, Healthy Futures. Uh, it's actually a five-county, uh, uh, we call Children's Health Initiative. Actually, interesting enough, Santa Clara County was the first one to create a Children's Health Initiative, so they were the model. Um, ours was the first multi-county initiative that wasn't run by a single uh, health plan. Um, and uh, we actually provided health dental vision coverage for children up to 300% of federal poverty didn't qualify for Medi-Cal healthy families. Uh, I was on the first five commission because I was on the first five commission and the medical society. I sort of sat in many different seats and so I was able to pull them all together. And so we got it funded by first five commissions, foundations, health systems, and health plans, particularly Kaiser Permanente provided some help. And then we helped over 65,000 children uh, back in 2000, start beginning in 2006. 
Um, unfortunately, what happened was is that in 2010, the Great Recession hit, and a lot of the foundations, their you know their investments cratered. So uh, essentially, we ended had to end it in 2010. Um, but I would point out, <clears throat> so so jump to the end, little at the end of the story. We'll get back to this. Is that in 2016, the state of California itself expanded health Medi-Cal coverage to all low-income children, regardless of immigration status. So in 2010, when things looked pretty bleak and we we're shutting this down, it's like what's going to happen to these kids? Um, eventually, this, uh, the state stepped up, and so those kids get healthcare coverage now. Now, the other big thing that was happening at the time uh, as well uh, was actually the Affordable Care Act. Ooh. And yes, uh, woo. <laughs> uh, which actually, in my mind, is actually the biggest health reform that's ever happened in the history of the country, bigger than Medicare or Medicaid. Um, and uh, now, remember I talked about a little bit about the AMA and uh, that Republican deal. And by the way, I should also mention when S-CHIP came around, um, because I was active in the um, uh, as, uh, in the AMA uh, as well as in the Massachusetts delegation, I couldn't get the AMA writ large, Mass Medical Science, all for it to actually support. They didn't oppose; they didn't support S chip. So I was pretty annoyed. Um, and actually, you know, one of the things that I uh, thought about was, okay, well, this organization doesn't seem to quite align with what I want. Do I leave or do I stay and change the organization? And uh, uh, and uh, so I said, well, I'm going to stay. And for the next 10 years, chipped away and set up policies um, within the AMA uh, to change their orientation. And so interesting enough, um, by the time the uh, ACA came around, um, they looked at the policy manual and said, oh, the leadership said, we have to support it because the policies all support this. And the more conservative element said, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait a minute. Is it? Uh, so, so actually um, at that time, and I was actually a, a delegate representing the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, rallied the folks and ensured that the AMA did, uh, continued to support. In fact, I will point out that if you carefully pay attention to uh, the, the publicity around the ACS, it was going through. Every time you saw President Obama, when he was not by himself, it was always the president of the AMA standing next to him. The AMA was all on board. Now, I'll tell you, within the AMA, there were certainly differences in divisions. Uh, but the AMA was entire was basically, if it wasn't for, you know, well, the AMA barely, the ACA barely made it, literally by the skin of its teeth. And if the AMA wasn't there the entire time, it would not have happened. And this is President Obama coming to the AMA. I was actually there at that meeting, speaking to to the House of Delegates. And so we we ensured uh there's a you know, group of us that ensure that the AMA did not back down from supporting the ACA. And so that was really important. And so the ACA passed. And then, and then there's, there's issue of implementation. Okay. So um, Great Recession hits. Um, I told you Healthy Kids, Healthy Futures has to shut down. Um, med they can't pass a budget on time. I saw community clinics essentially not unable to meet payroll. Can you imagine you work at a clinic and they suddenly say, well, guess what? Because they can't pass a budget, we can't get payments from Medi-Cal. And so we can't pay you. We can't give you a paycheck. That's what was happening. And so I got pretty frustrated. And also, by the way, I take care of a lot of kids who have learning disabilities and mental health issues and the mental health was being cut. So um, never had held elected office and said, I'm running for the California state legislature. Um, little problem um, was is that I lived in this district. Um, so District Five uh, noticed. Uh, now I'm. This is a nonpartisan talk, but I have, I'm, I'm a lifelong Democrat, and you'll see that there are more Republicans than Democrats in that district. Also, I would make note the last line: This district is a safe Republican. So, Democrat says I'm running for this seat. And um, in 2010, by the way, if you paid attention to 2010, that's Republicans took over Congress again. It was not a really good year for Democrats. So um, I ran in this seat. By the way, it, uh, not a lot of Asians either. Um, so just this is an Asian American who, <laughs> um, and I actually, and I win. The only Democrat to flip a Republican seat in the entire country in any state legislative or federal legislative election. So uh, that's what happens in 2010, kind of exciting, um, but um, 
it was really, it was frankly talked to uh, the voters about the importance of getting things done. So off I go to the state capitol and the legislature. I'm just going to sort of summarize my time in the legislature. Uh, California, when I started, uh, was the ninth largest economy in the world. By the time I left, it was the fifth largest economy. Our state budget was $28 billion in a whole. Uh, by the way, that's in a state budget of less than $100 billion. Uh, I would point out that we could have closed, um, we could have eliminated all of welfare, uh, eliminated all the prison system, and we still wouldn't close the budget. Uh, by the time I left, $30 billion reserve. The uninsured rate for non-elderly, so basically anyone who was under the Medicare age, so 0.64 was, the uninsured rate was 21% at the time I came in. Uh, now it was a great recession, but actually before that, it was really basically around 18 uh, percent for decades. For decades, people said you can't move that thing. All right. When I left, six percent. And school vaccination rates, because I did vaccination bills, was ninety point seven to ninety four. And actually, ninety four was because after COVID, it did drop a little bit. So it actually the peak was actually higher than that. But when I left, it was ninety four percent. Um, so anyway, so let's talk about the details. So we talk, I talked about the Affordable Care Act passed, right? Well, we have to implement it. Uh, don't try reading this slide, but just to give you an idea of the complexity of trying to implement the ACA. This is the California Healthcare Foundation. These were all the things that we had to consider doing, right? So there was a lot of work to do over many years. Um, Sometimes, I mean, the ACA is turned just turned 14, uh, actually last week. Uh, so there were some celebrations about that. But what was the ACA? What was in there? Well, uh, so first of all, perhaps most importantly were the health insurance reforms. And uh, so the ban on discrimination by pre-existing conditions. So before, if you had a pre-existing condition, they'd say, well, guess what? Either your insurance rates are gonna be really high or you couldn't, they wouldn't even offer it to you. All right, so you had a lot of people who couldn't get healthcare coverage or they got job block, right? Because the problem is, is that you got your healthcare coverage, your job, if you left your job and you lost your existing healthcare coverage, because you got sick or something, and they said, well, now you have, a, or let's say you got sick and you recovered, you have a pre-existing condition, wherever you go next would say, no, we can't provide you healthcare coverage, right? Uh, in fact, I actually authored state law to uh, implement that in state law. We established essential benefits. So you'd have plans that would actually uh, exclude certain things. Uh, it was interesting, um, uh, uh, Congressman, or former Congressman McCarthy, the former speaker, I remember he came to the California Medical Association and complained about the fact that the ACA required essential benefits because after all, he and his wife were past childbearing age and therefore why should they have to pay for maternity coverage, uh, the cost of maternity care. So anyway, but we established essential benefits so that we wanted to be sure we didn't like cherry pick out people who had particular <laughs> conditions. Uh, actually, used to be you had annual limits and lifetime coverage caps. So I know we just heard the story about, um, uh, and but you had people with cancer who literally would hit their lifetime cap, and then the healthcare coverage would say, "Okay, we're done." You're like, "Wait, wait, wait a minute! I'm still alive. I still need, you know, I'm still, you know, dealing with my cancer." And like, "Oh, you hit your lifetime cap. We're done, right?" Or your annual limit. So we we, we eliminated those. Uh, we actually also increased the coverage for, well, let's say young adults to 26, right? So, right, because if you're going to college or med school, right, you can actually be on your parents' plan. Now, some, some people might have started med school a bit later, but if as long as you're under 26, you can be on your parents' plan, right? And then uh, we did also establish an individual mandate for health coverage. Now, that's probably the least popular part because people, but the importance was is that we need to be sure people were in the market, right? If you're healthy, we didn't want you leaving the market and then saying, well, I'll just sign up when I get sick, right? Because otherwise we have to spread out the cost. Otherwise the coverage would be actually be unaffordable. Of course, we also covered, created a healthcare marketplace in the so-called individual market because you had to buy again insurance on your own. So that was covered California. Um, and then there were actually tax credits to help subsidize the cost uh, to, to make it more affordable, standardized plans again. Here in California, we create nine rating regions so that, again, within the healthcare market. The other important thing that we did is that California was an active purchaser. So what happens is that in the federal level, they created a market, but it's, called, uh, it's a passive. Basically, if you're a health plan, you say, hey, we have a plan that meets all the requirements. 
I get to put it on the market. In California, in order to get in Covered California, they actually have to negotiate with Covered California. Covered California looks at the proposal and says, are you doing everything you can to keep the cost down, the quality high, et cetera? So you can't just like show up and say, hey, we ticked off all the boxes. We want to be on the marketplace. So California actually, uh, as an active purchaser, uh, has been able to hold costs down even more. And of course, the other part on the coverage side is the Medi-Cal expansion to all low-income individuals under 100% of federal poverty level, but that also means you have to be documented. You cannot, you know, you cannot be an undocumented immigrant. So here in California, we also went beyond the ACA, not just uh, what the ACA did. Uh, so actually in 2016, as I mentioned earlier, we expanded to undocumented children. Uh, 20, also, we passed Prop 56 uh, here in the state of California. They increased the tobacco tax to fund increased child Medi-Cal provider payments. Um, nothing very residents worry about, but tendings or people have to run those. So they're like, okay, our payment's too low. Uh, we actually increased residence, funded additional residency positions and loan repayment for serving in underserved communities. So there's an opportunity if you're willing to uh, practice in a place with, uh, with a high Medi-Cal percentage, you could actually get some of your loans repaid. In 2019, we actually expanded it, not just to children, but young adults. Um, and then uh, we eliminated healthcare premium, uh, Medi-Cal, there were actually some premiums for families under 150% of federal poverty level. Then in 2022, we expanded it to uh, seniors who, and then finally this year, uh, which actually I, I actually worked on the legislation before I left, uh, but it got implemented this year, we entirely removed the exclusion for Medi-Cal for immigration status. So basically, uh, regardless of immigration status, as long as you meet the, the income requirements and so forth, you can get your Medi-Cal. And so you can see the result of that is, is that we see a drop in the uninsured and we saw a rise in the percentage of people in the Medi-Cal program. So it worked. Okay, well, uh, Donald Trump gets elected president. He tries to, he and the Republican Congress try to repeal the ACA. While they don't succeed, they actually try to destabilize the insurance market. So for example, remember I talked about the individual mandate? Well, they essentially turned it to zero. They didn't technically eliminate it, they made it. Uh, and so one of the things that started to happen was is that health plans started to get a little nervous. Okay, what's well, gonna happen? And so we actually took steps here in California to stabilize the healthcare market. So undercover California. So we actually established a state individual mandate to ensure we continue to keep healthy people into our covered California market 2019. But we also recognize that we're going to require people to get health care insurance or pay essentially a, a, a additional tax or fee. Uh, we also funded uh, premium subsidies to increase affordability. And the other thing that we did is um, in the original ACA, what happened is they provided subsidies for people up to 400% of the federal poverty level. Well, you live here in Palo Alto, 400% uh, of poverty level doesn't get you too far, right? So we actually extended subsidies up to people up to 600% of the federal poverty level because the federal poverty level is a national standard, generally tends to be under because of the cost of living here in California. Um, so we actually ended up stabilizing the California market. And in fact, the average premium growth uh, uh, in 2020 and 2021, it's actually under a percent. All right, think about that. No, that's um, not just below GDP, but under a percent. Um, the, now, 2021, the American Rescue Plan comes about. And so actually at the federal level, they finally did cap the insurance premiums at eight and a half percent of household income. And in the Inflation Reduction Act, said they capped to 2025. So now the state doesn't have to pay for it. The federal government is. But those are important steps, again, to get people health care coverage. So um, I like to say, so if you think about it, um, actually, uh, this is health insurance coverage for children, 0 to 18. Uh, the dark red line is actually the United States. Uh, and uh, I would point out that um, you know, I came into the legislature in 2010, uh, so this is for 2008, and you can see that um, 2000, uh, 2008, um, um, basically, used our health care coverage for children, actually, percentage of uninsured was actually above the national uh, rate, um, and because of the work and policies that we did, uh, not only did, it, and of course, the implementation of, of S-SHIP as well, uh, we not only brought down uh, and this goes from 2008. So uh, 
So basically you can see that we brought down not only the overall uninsured rate, but here in California, we did that even, we were actually brought down even further for kids beyond what happened nationally. So I like to think we did something right there. So, well, uh, maybe some next steps. Well, what am I doing now? Uh, as we mentioned, I'm on this uh, Office of Healthcare Affordability Board. So one of the issues that has come up is, is that healthcare, fortunately, has become uh, increasingly uh, un unaffordable for, for people here and uh, in in, not only in California, frankly, across the country. We see that cost sharing has continued to rise each year. Um, so that means that uh, when you buy health insurance, uh, you still have co-pays and deductibles that may make it less affordable. Uh, we also uh, are looking at you know healthcare costs and the rise of healthcare costs. Although I would make note that Paul Krugman, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist, made note that uh, healthcare spending actually has, because of the ACA, actually does line up with uh, the GDP growth. It used to be it grew faster than GDP. It's actually been fairly constant. Really, I mean, it goes up and down, but the 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 trend over the last 14 years. But still, we still have, that's something that we're continuing to struggle with. And so, in fact, actually, uh, one of the things that the Office of Healthcare Affordability is doing is, is that it's going to set cost targets. Uh, this actually follows in the wake of other states like Massachusetts, Oregon, uh, Rhode Island, some other states have done this. So uh, we're looking at trying, and it has slowed the growth of healthcare uh, uh, spending in, in those particular states. So we hope to achieve the same. <clears throat> Uh, the other thing is, is of course, uh, we know that health, we're very started off saying health is more than just healthcare. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the other reforms that I've got to work on in the legislature and now I'm working on implementation is actually incorporating social determinants health into our Medi Cal program. So we have a reform called Cal AIM. Uh, and so that actually pays for what's called, they call in lieu services. But for example, housing is one of those. So uh, we know people are struggling with housing. Uh, Cal AIM includes uh, funding to help subsidize housing navigation, even rental assistance. Uh, it also has a bunch of other things, transportation, other, other types of things as well. And uh, so that's just starting to roll out and people are starting to implement it. I actually am still on the United Way board. Our United Way is actually working on housing navigation and uh, rental subsidies. So we're working to roll out Cal AIM. So hopefully there's some opportunities as you're taking care of kids who have some of these other issues or that we can try to tap into some of those resources. And so we had to do a lot of work, not only of course to pass at the state, we had to get federal, because we get federal matching funds for Medicaid, we had to get the federal government to go along. So we got the federal waivers. Uh, and then of course, I've remained active in the American Academy of Pediatrics. I'm now in the Council on State Government Affairs. Uh, so hopefully we can uh, take some of the things that we've done here in California and help other states uh, do the same. So that's something uh, else that I'm involved in. So how do you practice medicine on a large scale? Well, people often ask me, Dr. Pan, okay, you did all this stuff. Well, how, how, how do I do that you know, as a resident, uh, as a fellow, as someone, right? And I, I should point out that, uh, you know what, when I was uh, in residency, I was just like you. I was you know, there listening to Grand Rounds, noon conference, and, uh, and it's, it's really about uh, engagement, right? So um, first thing I say, I do say is, is that participate in your professional associations, right? So like, like the American Academy of Pediatrics or the CMA or the AMA, right? And, and why, why is that important? Well, actually uh, a few things that it's very important about that to me is that, and, I, and I, they shared my story about the AMA where I got frustrated with the organization, but uh, this is the association of people who essentially uh, at least share the same, many of the same experiences you do. Right. And so if you uh, if the good place to start, if you want to, try to persuade people, right, because frankly, building political will is about building coalitions. Right. We talked about political will. Right. We got the other parts. You can do your research and do your papers and stuff. If the political will is about really um, figure out how do you build coalitions, how do you get people to go along? Well, the first group of people you should be trying to persuade are people like yourself. Right. Fellow doctors who do come from a variety, wide variety of uh, political ideology, backgrounds, et cetera. But um, we all share common experiences as people take care of patients. We all went to medical school and residency. So there are certain commonalities that you can start with there. Uh, the other thing is, is that, you know, as a, as a physician, when you go out and you, you know, interact with policymakers, you're much stronger. You're like, oh, well, I'm Dr. So-and-so, and I think this should happen. You say, well, I'm Dr. So-and-so, but I can say that because I'm going to represent the American Academy of Pediatrics or the, you know, but 
that my colleagues as well agree with me, right? Uh, so it's not just me alone. It's also uh, try, you know, representing the larger group. The other thing that's really important is, is that, um, by the way, each of these organizations usually have government relations bodies. Well, if you're a member, they work for you. Uh, so what I mean by that is, uh, it's you know, as a as a resident, a fellow, an attending, you know, I'm pretty busy. Uh, you're pretty busy. You don't have time to track every single little bill, right? Uh, so when you're a member, the 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 GR staff, that's your job, right? So you can say, hey, you know, they're always interested in people who are interested in legislation. You go. You know, I'm really interested in this area. I'm interested in these this bill or what bills are going on in this area. I'm really happy to talk to you about it and tell you, right? And can you let me know what's going on with that? Oh, sure, right? Because they're like, okay, that's the person who I might want to get involved. Do I need the doctor to go talk to someone, right? So, so, so instead of hiring your own lobbyist for yourself, you probably can't afford that. Uh, your organization already has that, so it's a way to actually and there and. Frankly, they've, uh, they're always interested in engaging people who, are, you know, who want to be involved. They're always looking for members who want to actually uh, engage. So, so all those become really important in, in, uh, in giving you that opportunity to do things. In fact, when I was in Massachusetts, as I said, you know, I got to get a chance to be at the table at some really important policymaking decisions uh, because of that, because I was involved. The other thing I say is uh, follow a health policy topic really closely. Now, you're too, so by the way, when I say this is that, um, so what happens is that healthcare is really big. There's a lot of different moving parts, okay? And you're not going to be able to follow all of that, right? Because you, after all, you're trying to get through residency or fellowship or whatever, you know. Uh, so, but if you take an area of something you're interested in and you just follow it closely, you can, you know, you that becomes the model, right? And what you want to do is sort of follow it 360, like understand the ins and outs in the back. So, so basically, uh, and so actually the example I'm going to give is, is that, so what did I do? Well, I decided to pick a very obscure policy topic called the financing of residency education. <laughs> okay. Uh, I got first got in, interested in that uh, back in my day, back when I was in college, because I was Center Hospital Finance and Management. They were looking at teaching hospitals, uh, and then said, okay, I'm just going to follow this subject closely. And so anytime, you know, now you can with Google, but it used to be you go through Medline and say any, any new published, anybody published something new about this topic, right? And, you, and, 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 and I read it, right, if someone did, right? And there wasn't that many, you know, it was, it was pretty manageable amount of stuff. But the other thing that happened was is that as I was reading this and um, I became a bit of an expert on that. Right. Uh, when you pick a particular topic, a uh, uh, narrow topic, you become a bit of an expert and you start hearing, you know, you start learning and, and you know, start noticing that the same, some of the same people are writing the stuff too. And so, so every, you know, you could even run into them, call them up and say, Hey, by the way, I saw what you wrote. Can you share a little bit with me about this? Right. And then the other thing is you get seen as an expert. So interesting enough that interest that I followed uh, through my training on this eventually event uh, resulted in me being made appointed a member of the Committee of Pediatric Workforce with the American Academy of Pediatrics. And then of course, me authoring a policy statement on that very topic. So that's the policy statement that was that I authored. And you can see there I am, star contributor. Actually, I was already off the committee. This is the second version of that, but you know, again, lead author. So, um, but uh, I always think that that's a, you know, if you're interested in policy, pick some policy topic and just, you know, that you're interested in, just follow that closely, okay? Um, and learn from that, right, by, by doing that. And I think that's, and then that becomes a model for looking at lots of other issues as well. And then the other part I would say is also, uh, you wanna learn about your, patient, your patient's community, right? Uh, so remember we talked about social determinants of health and so forth. So, uh, you know, um, whoop, uh, so uh, of course that's why I came to UC Davis. We talked about you know, learning about the community, think, looking and not just about the problems that are happening in the community, but about the strength and the assets. Uh, so uh, this book is actually a book that I used for the program that I developed at UC Davis, uh, Building Communities from Inside Out, about uh, really called something called asset-based community development. We looked at the strengths in the communities. We looked at, you know, you want to understand the people who live in the community and what the gifts they have, the associations, the social networks in the community, and then of course the institutions. But those are usually the ones we are already familiar with, like the school, you know, the government entities, the businesses, the um, 
not for profits. But what we often don't understand as much is we often look at the people who live in, particularly um, in communities, as being um, not necessarily looking at their assets and the gifts that they can provide. So uh, doing a community doing a community tour, right? Uh, go, you know, think about where your patients coming from. Well, have you ever been in their neighborhood? Have you actually walked around, right? Have you looked at what kind of things are there? And I think that's really important as well. So those, those would be three things that I would suggest in terms of how to say, practice uh, pediatrics uh, or practice medicine at large. So with that, um, I wanna thank you so very much uh, for having me here today. I wanna be sure I left some time for questions uh, and uh, thank you so very much. And again, it's a tremendous honor to be here with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Pan, for Thank such you. an awesome oh, presentation. Sure. Thank you. Um, we have about, I think, 10 minutes yeah. for questions. Does anyone in the audience want to walk up to the mic? Or, or Serena, if you could pass it around. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That was a, a great talk. Thank can, you. Can you speak to uh, any internal challenges or struggles you had uh, being probably being less of a clinician taking on all of this work? Well, I mean, I, um, and I don't mean less in, uh, I just, yeah, no, 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 as a right. clinician. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, cer certainly one of the challenges is, um, is trying, is being sure you articulate the value of the work that you're doing to the, I guess, the people paying your paycheck. Right. So I was at UC Davis. All right. Um, and uh, I think like, well, for those of you who are in training, basically, you know, you said, okay, you got this much time, right? Um, you got to do so much clinical to make up this part of your salary. You got maybe some administrative part because I was like involved in the residency program. And then uh, you had to get grants to essentially fund the rest of your time, right? For whatever research you're doing. Uh, and uh, so, so part of that really was uh, trying to uh, articulate like, okay, well, how's this benefit? Um, the department and the uh, the institution. Uh, so uh, it was important to sort of communicate to to the people I worked for uh, how how this helped. Uh, that that can be a challenge because it depends on how they look at things, right? Uh, the, the good news was is that um, the I quickly made friends with the community relations folks. All right. So because after all, every hospital needs to do community benefits, right? Um, public relations was kind of important. And I quickly made friends with them because what happened is I was going out doing these things in the community, right? Um, the school or the hospital could count it as part of their community benefit, right? And frankly, they repaid me. So I was like, okay, fine. You know, th well, they didn't exactly do it. There was a line item that went into the department budget because, uh, but it, 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 it reflected well on, on, on the department. So, uh, and that was stuff that they actually could boast to of their, you know, when they went to their, they had a community advisory board and they'd say, oh, look, you know, we're doing this stuff. See, and there's this Dr. Pan in pediatrics, he's doing this stuff. So it, so it is important to try to you know, identify uh, folks who, uh, to both to discuss your value, but also identify people within the institution who would also value that and be sure they knew what you were doing. But no, that's a very important point. Uh, I, I mean, one of the things that I talked a bit about when I did my training program with the residents, you know, we gained residents at the community was actually talking to the residents about how do you communicate this to your future employers, right? Uh, the value of what you're doing, because ultimately, whether you go into private practice or you go into academia or whatever other role, um, it is important that, uh, you know, to be able to describe what value that brings to the practice, to the institution you're at. Hi, thanks Hi. again for a really inspiring talk um, and a great story about persistence. Um, I, my question is around civic health. So the state of Oregon um, at the end of 2023 passed a law that essentially lets healthcare organizations, um, nonprofit and for-profit kind of be like the DMV. Um, do you foresee California being able to pass a law like that, that allows patients to sort of non-paternalistically advocate for themselves? Um, so actually, you know what, maybe before you hand off the microphone there, can you elaborate a little more back? I'm not as familiar with that, exactly oh. what that bill does. Oh yeah. So they basically said that, um, the law, and I can try to find the text cause I, I have to run a clinic. So my brain is fried. Okay. <laughs> um, um, but at the end of 2023, they passed a law that allows, um, nonprofit and for-profit healthcare organizations to 
allow voter registration oh, okay. has to stay nonpartisan, obviously, right. same as the DMV and they use the Motor Voter Act. Um, but Oregon just passed it and they're implementing it currently um, starting in January of okay. this year. Okay, so that voter registration. So actually, interesting enough, there's a whole nother talk I give uh, because this is election year on um, on on like call how do we get uh, voters for kids? Um, but uh, so for well, first of all, there's no law saying you can't register uh, people for um, uh, for voter registration in a clinical setting. There's no law against it. I mean, if you want to do it, you should go ahead and do it. Um, I actually think uh, to just elaborate on that. Uh, voter registration certainly is very important here in California. By the by, the way, you can actually register on the day you vote. So here in California, what we've done is we try to lower the barriers to voter registration. the The more important thing is is that getting people to vote. So obviously, voter registration is a step in that, but we should follow through on that. So I, I'm all in support of things like that bill uh, that, you know, getting people to do voter registration materials. I think there's another, there's a group um, trying to figure that they're doing voter registration ERs and so forth. Uh, but as someone who's been elected office, there's actually, if you look at the turnout, the real problem is getting people to vote itself. And we've done everything we can in, well, in California, frankly, to make it easy for people to vote. We mail everyone a ballot, et cetera. It's about getting people to vote. And um, I'm going to give the very, really short version of this talk I'm gonna, that, that I give on uh, getting people to vote is, is that um, what I learned when I ran for office is that basically um, candidates and parties, because of a limited amount of money, I know people say, oh, look at all the money in politics. Actually, there's not very much. Uh, basically, only communicate to most frequent voters. So if you just registered someone and they've never voted before, no one's talking to them. Candidates aren't talking to them. Parties aren't talking to them. Who do I vote for? Um, if you have someone, a parent, by the way, the, the people who vote the least are parents of young children. Lowest voter turnout, by the way, I know that. And I can see the data. And by the way, everyone elected office knows that. So every time you talk to an elected official, they're like, of course, we want to do it to help them. But they're not the ones who are going to keep me in office. That becomes a problem, right? Um, what we need to do is because those folks, people aren't engaging them, we don't have to engage them in a partisan way or in a way where we're advocating for a particular candidate. Uh, we can just remind them it's actually election day. Believe it or not, most people don't know when election day happens. Actually, you should ask your patients how many of them knew uh, we had a primary election, you know, just a month ago. Uh, did, did we did? I, I didn't know that. I haven't heard anything about it. because if you're not a frequent voter, no one's calling you, no one's mailing you, no one's telling you anything. Now, we could step in and do it ourselves. Doctor's offices, after all, don't we have reminder systems that do like, hey, by the way, your appointment's coming up. Why don't you tell your reminder system? Oh, by the way, election day is coming up. You should vote. Not even like who to vote for. Reminder system. You have the phone numbers and addresses for all the patients. That's the thing campaigns don't have. By the way, it's very expensive to get that information. You have it, use it, remind people, time to vote. So, I mean, get them registered, but then use the reminder system to say, hey, by the way, you know, there's election day coming out, you should vote. You don't have to say who. Anyway, okay. I... <laughs> Hi, Dr. Van. Yes. I'm Calvin, I'm one of the third year residents. So thank you so much for your talk. I had a question about um, your sort of, at the very end, you talked about graduate medical education. And my question is about, if you have any sort of like insight or opinion on what the next, you know, five to 10 years looks like in terms of uh, sort of like bridging or sort of like filling um, our, our, the big dearth of like pediatric subspecialties or even just pediatric care, either in California the state or across the country, whether like that pertains to um, having medical school costs, um, having like uh, just the gap between pediatric and adult medicine specialties. Um, so, so first of all, when we talk about uh, workforce, right, and people entering, and so certainly I've been watching the match and paying attention to the match, right? Actually, the percentage, the number of U.S. medical graduates, which are generally the people who have uh, the preferred people for residency, hate to say that because the other applicants, IMGDOs, are certainly very, you know, uh, very qualified. Uh, we've seen that decline in pediatrics. So what happened just happened in pediatrics was no surprise in that regards. Um, the, 
when it comes to workforce, the real challenge is actually um, the working conditions when you come out, right? So some, so some of the issues that we talked about, what will you do? Well, one is that, of course, um, kids, for most part, are not on Medicare. Uh, they're on Medicaid. And Medicaid payment is generally much lower than Medicare. In fact, actually, I, uh, when I was chair of the budget committee in the Senate, we actually got a version of the state budget out from the Senate that actually raised all of Medi-Cal for pediatrics, primary care and specialty, to Medicare rates. Unfortunately, the assembly and the governor did not go along, and that did, but we actually had a whole state budget proposal that included that. And I got that in there and we got, I got it out of the Senate. I could not get the assembly and the governor to go along. And so that got dropped um, because you, know, you got to get all, everyone to agree. Um, so we, we do have to figure out how, how to do that. But um, one, one of the challenges actually interesting enough, but on the Medicaid side is, is that, well, again, this goes back to children don't vote, but more importantly, the parents don't vote. Okay. Um, and so for example, uh, we talked about the block granting of Medicaid, that proposal, and it died and how it died. Do, do, you know who, do you know who actually keeps it from dying? It keeps that thing from dying? It keeps that dying so that we don't block grant Medicaid? Is it, is it kids? Is it children's families? Half of all kids are covered by Medicaid. Is it children's families that are the ones who prevent the block granting of Medicaid? Unfortunately, no. We're not enough political force to do that. It's middle class families who have parents who are on long term care because that's where most of the money goes. And they're terrified that if we block grant Medicaid, that suddenly they're gonna have to pick up the cost of providing the nursing home care for their parents because they can't afford it. That's a political force that's keeping Medicaid from being block granted. We've got to figure out how to mobilize parents of children. If we don't do that, we're not going to be able to get the attention of, let's put it this way, policymakers, that's really, policymakers care about kids because they care about kids, but it's not what keeps them in, posi in the position of being policymakers. And if we can't change that, we're gonna, we, we keep struggling against that. And so that's why I, you know, I said, we've got to figure out how to build those kind of coalitions that actually um, make sure that parents, you know, um, basically we have, we have to build more political will there, frankly. I hope that didn't sound too bleak. <laughs> yeah, we gotta do more. Thank you for this awesome discussion. Okay. Um, because it's nine o'clock, I wanna let our audience go and then we'll, we can hang around for a little bit afterwards for some more questions. Thank you everyone for right. coming. Okay, thank you so much, thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.